Welcome back to Blockstream Talk. Today we're talking to Kyle Fry, CEO at Digital. Kyle and his team have been deep in the digital securities trenches for a number of years already and have built out a network of securities exchanges and alternative trading venues to support digital security or security token trading. Obviously, given my day job, there's a lot of overlap and synergy with what Kyle and his team are doing and what we're doing at Bitfinex Securities. I think this was a great conversation and it's good to get Kyle's perspective on where they see the digital security industry evolving, why Liquid is a good choice for issuers, and what the benefits of digital securities are for users and issuers. What is tokenization and what's the point? If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Hey, Kyle, thanks for doing this. It's good to see you. Good to see you, Jesse. To start off, do you want to kind of run us through, um, you know, what your background is, uh, who digital is, and what was your path to Bitcoin and security tokens or digital securities? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I've been in the uh, digital asset space for five years now. I left Credit Suisse. I was doing tech m a for just over 10 years um, on, on Wall Street. I spent time on payments and fintech, and what's interesting is, I saw blockchain. Uh, it was blockchain, not Bitcoin necessarily when I started um, as the this idea that it would it would enhance how payment infrastructure work, just better, cheaper, faster, less intermediaries, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I went full tilt, left, um, joined a firm, went really deep down the blockchain rabbit hole. This was sort of um, just beginnings of the ICO craze days. Um, and that's where I think, you know, the word token or coin sort of got a negative connotation. But about a year in, you know, based on on my experience and where I saw everything going and all these unregistered securities offerings, I knew that the, the biggest impact and thing I wanted to help solve for was on, on the capital market side. So although I saw the, the notion that uh, blockchain was really kind of built and originally came through as sort of for payments. And then all these different payment mechanisms came out and turned into tokens and unregistered securities offerings. I saw the idea over time that first year that tokenization would really disrupt capital markets um, in a big way. So uh, jumped into digital securities. I'm, I'm CEO of digital. Um, my co-founder and I, James Wallace, have been working together for the better part of about four years together. Um, we spent millions of dollars um, and ultimately what we're trying to solve is, um, you know, issuers and investors and trying to use technology and services to close that gap in a better, cheaper, faster way, which will allow issuers a lower cost of capital, will allow innovators to um, raise capital and, and make the world a better place. And really to shift the focus to back to the investor, the powers, the investor, where you put your money matters um, and allowing people to really have a voice and a vote to where they put their money. Um, and so we, we actually can launch our own products and look to serve the community, uh, the investing community. So the sort of more uh, tagline view of what digital does is we collect, we connect global investors to high quality assets and we connect global issuers with global capital at a fraction of the cost. And the way we do that, as you know, Jesse, in the conversations we have is uh, through stock exchanges, digital security stock exchanges, because that ultimately, to our, in our view, is going to allow the most, the least amount of friction for capital markets activity. Okay. So the one I know about is is Merge. Are, do you want to talk a little bit about who Merge is? And, and are there any others as well that you guys are working with? Yeah, sure. So Merge is based in the Seychelles. They've been a stock exchange since 2012. Uh, so they have, you know, they've been in operation for a very long time. Um, they've built a pretty unique infrastructure over time. Um, a lot of, you know, there's sort of the, the exchange and then there's all the post trade stuff, which is a, typically a lot of the challenge we see in NASDAQ and the traditional capital markets. And what a lot of, frankly, ATSs and MTFs lack is that post trade element, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But Merge has the exchange, the CSD. So who owns the shares, the registry, as well as the clearinghouse. So that's the settlement part. So when you send somebody the security, um, the the funds settle as well at the same time. So the transaction happens immediate. It's immediate real-time growth settlement. One of the only exchanges in the world that is meant to be more global. It has 20 trading hours. Uh, it's the first stock exchange and only stock exchange in the world that has um, crypto on-ramps. 
Um, they have a full integration with, with Circle for USDC. Um, and they've been, you know, in 2018, they've decided to move to this hybrid model of being able to facilitate digital securities trading. So, you know, for us over the years, um, and I'm sure you saw this too, Jesse, back in the polymath days and ICOs, it was sort of this business model was like, I promise you, I'm going to tokenize it. And then I promise you, it's going to be better. There's liquidity and all these cool things that everyone reads about. And the reality of it is, if we don't get these things to trade compliantly, underscore bold, compliantly, then it doesn't really work. Well, that's the whole value proposition. Yeah, that's right. That, that's a big part of the value proposition, right? Is the secondary markets and liquidity. That's a big part of what we're doing. Yeah, hundred percent. And and so the, and there's probably one key line there that we went super deep on was the most complex to solve, but was this idea of retail investor versus accredited and so or institutional. So at you know private markets and, and peer to peer, how much can that really do if it doesn't allow the average citizen on a global basis? But obviously that's where all the reg- that's where a lot of the regulation comes in. I wouldn't say all of it, but a significant amount of the regulation. So we saw MERS as an opportunity. We actually went pretty deep uh, at the Gibraltar stock exchange. We spent millions of dollars, took a board seat um, ultimately found out that the regulator was not ready to give approval for the securities to trade. So they had an entire digital framework and allowed us in. And we were so excited. Tokenization, these things are going to trade. And then they were like, but um, we're not giving approval for equities to trade. And so we basically kind of left and went deep on merge. Um, there's some others building. I think what, you know, the ATS, ATS in the United States, I think are going to, continue to be a challenge. You know, you've got um, Archax in the UK, Fusan in Malaysia, um, you know, uh, Bifinex Securities in Kazakhstan, what you're doing, Jesse. I think there are other venues, and I don't think this is by any means winner takes all. I do think that because Merge uh, has the legacy credentials as well, World Federation of Exchanges, Qualified Foreign Exchange, there are pieces to it that allow for it to bridge between sort of legacy and digital infrastructure, particularly because we can facilitate the trading in both legacy and digital securities while we kind of move on through this adoption. So I'd say they're probably quite a bit ahead, but frankly, we are having other conversations with other um, smaller exchanges that see digital as a good step change for their countries and a way to sort of bridge the gap on financial infrastructure. So, you know, I do think there's a head start there, but generally speaking, I think there's some others that are, are looking to kind of follow suit. So merges in Seychelles, you know, Bitfinex Securities, we're in Kazakhstan. Those are two regimes that I think typically people don't think of as like global financial centers. And you mentioned that the U.S. is a challenge, I think probably you know, the, you know, a lot of the big incumbent players in financial markets, those regulatory regimes are, are all probably challenges. So w- what do you say to people that are kind of surprised that, you know, that you're coming to them from the Seychelles or that we're coming from the AIFC in Kazakhstan? Wh- why, what's your explanation for why th- this opportunity is in kind of these economies and regulatory regimes that people have typically thought of as more peripheral? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is I think one of the the facts that I think people forget about is, you know, Caymans, that's not a very big from a population perspective. But if you think about almost every single hedge fund in the entire world has an office there. And so um, there's this idea of offshoring uh, from a tax perspective, as well as just being more global. I think, honestly, I'm, I'm a US guy, I live in the United States, I know the regulatory environment extremely well, but dealing with the United States regulatory environment, dealing with the IRS, there are issues. Now, there are protections on the U.S. side, and, and one could argue, but I think that it actually creates a, a lot of innovation stifling. And so if you look at a lot of the innovative companies or, or businesses, in particular in the technology, even if you're a U.S. person, you tend to try to start outside of the United States. So you can really build a business, you can test things, you could build, and then over time, when you're willing to spend the money and the legal and et cetera, you, you come in uh, to, to the United States you know, Bermuda um, was pretty progressive in the early days back in 2017, 2018 with their digital asset framework. Um, and, you know, and that was where we took uh, this company called TribeOS and got the world's first federally approved digital security where, you know, most regulars don't approve a security. We actually took TribeOS and got it approved by the Bermudan government under this new 
digital framework. And when you think about the the Bermudas and the Kazakhstans and um, Seychelles and Barbados, uh, Gibraltar, some of these smaller jurisdictions, again, I think what gives them this the digital assets gives them an opportunity to sort of bridge immediately into the new financial infrastructure, which to their benefit will allow them to sort of increase innovation and allow things to happen both for their local country and for them to kind of move up on, on the world stage. Um, I think a, a, another sort of example of how this works is in Africa, the infrastructure for just regular banks isn't there. But when the internet and a phone came out, it was so much easier for them to adopt banking on the phone faster than most other places uh, in Western economies in the world, just because you needed that. And this technology is there and you're adopting it faster. And so I think those sorts of ideas and the, uh, you know, the progressiveness of these different countries and what I'd really love to see. And, and the thing that one of the things we're, we're actually trying to stitch together is how can they work closer together, all these different smaller countries towards this new global digital financial infrastructure and just how do we get all moving in the same direction? And that's for a lot of things, by the way, is right. Something's way more powerful when you have people aligned with the vision versus versus kind of fighting each other on this. Yeah, that was kind of my hope for the the Bitcoin bond. I'm you know, not exactly sure where that's at at the moment. But if you can get one big win, like something really high profile like that, I, I think there's a lot of jurisdictions that, you know, you've got the push factor and then you'd also have the pull factor to start pulling people into this, um, you know, upgrade to capital markets. And, and uh, on to your point about how it's difficult to interact with the U.S. Um, in some ways, the U.S. retail is like the next level up, right? So that was with the Blockstream mining note. That was the number one. The top two feedback I got back on the Blockstream mining note was number one, sir, when U.S. <laughs> and number two, sir, <laughs> when, when yes, S S E R. And number two, yeah. uh, when retail, right? And when smaller ticket sizes. So those yeah. that was like the you know. Yeah. The two biggest feedbacks I've got, I got back on the blockchain mining note. Well, I was just going to say there are, I mean, I, there are ways to get into the U.S. market, right? I mean, and and honestly, you know, there's two different sort of things that people are concerned about. Um, on, you know, there's the Forty Act concerns if yeah. you're um, thinking about, you know, wanting needing to be uh, registered as an investment company, and then there's just the um, the exemptions, you know, Reg CF, for example, is only U.S. companies. Reg A is both Canadian and U.S., and you can actually raise debt on a Reg A. So there are ways to kind of go after the United States. Um, we're actually running a 504 right now, which is this much more esoteric, painful process where you actually have to file with every single state where there's a retail investor. Um, and so, but depending on the objectives and the time and complexity, there is a way to approach the United States. You just have to do it in a way that's, that's extremely thoughtful in terms of the approach. Yeah. It's compliment complicated. It's costly. And the, the consequences are significant if you get it wrong. Right. Yeah. So yeah, moving on, I wanted to talk about nomenclature because you and I had this discussion previously, but I, I like the term security token. And, and I know that you're not wild about that. You prefer digital securities. And, and I think, you know, for me, the ICO boom was also a massive proof of concept. Like there was a lot of things out of that that, that I liked. I liked that retail investors could participate in these investments that were previously completely walled off. You know, I liked that it was global. I liked that people could invest in really small sizes. You know, in, in hindsight, there was a lot wrong with it as well, right? So there was no, there was no invest, there was no um, issue or obligations at all. There was no concept of investor protection. Some of these massive projects you know, they even went out and said, hey, you are getting nothing in return for this token. And then they go on to raise hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. So, but I think we're talking about the same thing when we talk about security tokens and digital security. So what do you mean when you use that term digital security? What, what, what meets that definition to you? Yeah. So, so, so step one, we both have the word security and that's probably the most <laughs> important term um, that we need to, yeah. to put around it. So I'll, I'll answer that by saying, you know, one of, one of the things we talk about to remind folks of, you know, sort of how this work has worked over time, there's paper securities, right? More bearer instrument. You have the share certificate in your hands and to sell it, you have to sign it over to someone else. And then there's electronic securities. And that's really where we are today. That's T plus two. When you own a share, do you really even own it until it's settled two days later on DTCC? GameStop has proved that that's a big issue. And that's part of why you know, the, the capital infrastructure has gotten bloated over time with so many 
intermediaries and, and roadblocks. And I think they were added for, you know, compliance regulation, conflicts of interest. And at the time, perhaps made sense to add a new thing. But over time, as the capital markets grew, this infrastructure and plumbing didn't grow with it in terms of uh, the stakes, the size of the country, the, the, the way that it is to manipulate, um, even in these capital markets. And then you got the so electronic securities where we are today, and then digital securities. More back to kind of paper, but it's the digital form. If you own it, you have it. It's your keys. Um, and I, I think the important thing, actually, what well, I'll stop there is this idea of uh, you know not your keys, not your crypto. And I think that's different. I think that's a bit of the the silver lining on the security side is because whether we like it or not, um, there are going to be market rules and KYC, and then there are exemptions, and we have to follow the rules. Yeah. White lists, yeah. Of who owns the securities, that's exactly right. So paper securities move to electronic securities, which aren't real securities. It's a big mess of a noise. And digital securities move us back to the ethos of this. So now moving back where, you know, security token was probably the most used term when I kind of, you know, after my first year in going down the rabbit hole, and it continues to be a, a well-known term that folks use. I won't let it die. Okay, yeah, no no problem. Neither was security token markets, given their name. Um, so. The security token, you know, the word token to us and coin received super negative connotation. And I think that it highlights something I think is not as relevant. I think the most relevant thing is the word security. And the second thing is just that it's digital. And so the fact that it's a token or a coin, I think these terms, again, have got negative connotations so over time. We've just adopted digital securities full on. But I think you and I are talking about the exact same thing in terms of, you know, uh, digitization of the new uh, global infrastructure. Yeah, I, I think token has negative connotations. It also has positive connotations, right? Like super low friction, ease of use. Um, and, and when I think about my definition of what a security token is, is it, you know, you had some of these exchanges over the last year or so that had tokenized U.S. equity. And it's, it's basically just an Excel, Excel spreadsheet entry, right? You can't withdraw it. You can't do anything with it. So my kind of definition of a security token is obviously it's a security, but it also meets all of these criteria of things you can do like uh, on liquid with transfer restricted assets where I could, you know, I could withdraw it. I could self custody it. I could ping it back and forth to my friends peer to peer, um, you know, move it to other exchanges and do arbitrage and all of this stuff that's doable because it's in this whitelisted ecosystem that makes it permissible. So it's not exactly a bearer security. I, I think like if you can imagine doing Apple shares as an ERC-20 with like no restrictions, like a, you, you know, like a stable coin or something, I, I don't think that's possible anymore. So that's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think regulators are particularly fond of, you know, a new electronic way to do bearer securities. I don't think that's possible. But all of those things, taking it off the exchange, self-custodying it within a whitelisted ecosystem, that's kind of my definition of a, of a security token or digital security. Awesome. Mine too. I think that, you know, that is the dream, you know, the, uh, and we could, we could get right into the benefits of, of what we think about the digital infrastructure and being a security token, because I think this idea, well, first of all, just better, cheaper, faster, lower cost, lower risk, more value creation for everyone. And I think that, um, I, I think it's important to also remember, like, you know, this is a little different than the, the payment side, where it's, again, less intermediaries, because peer to peer, you own your money, no regulation, that's your wealth, like that's yours, there should be no friction. On, um, you know, the digital security side, a lot of these intermediaries that exist will continue to exist. However, they will be in a much more different form. They won't have as much power. They won't cost as much. And so let's talk about the blockchain, for example. It's meant liquid network is meant to be the registry. Who owns the shares? How many shares are outstanding? You can't duplicate them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, someone has to still be accountable for the reporting and ongoing obligations for who owns what. Somebody needs to be accountable to the regulators. That's not going to go away. So there's still a, a CSD, but the CSD doesn't have a whole back office moving books around and then determining an Excel spreadsheet, now they can look at the blockchain. So it just, it takes that role, makes it more efficient, less people, less cost. Um, but in terms of on the investor side, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to so many of the cool things that we're always talking about. And there are some out there and we're uh, building some in our pipeline as well. But an investor has a token 
and they can receive distributions on chain and distributions, both coupon payments for interest on, on debt or dividends in equity and directly on chain choose. Do you want Bitcoin? Do you want a, a stable coin directly? Um, but being able to do that on chain voting, right? We've seen voting proliferate in the crypto space in terms of are we going to fork? What are the changes we should do as a community? And this idea of power back to the people. And this goes beyond normal governance shareholder votes where you have this shareholder meeting one time a year where most people don't go. They don't vote. They get this 80-page document of a prospectus and they're not going to do anything with it. They let Fidelity vote for them. Um, as their proxy, but you know, imagine being able to click a button and vote for a certain board member or a certain thing, or eventually like, hey, got, what do you guys want? What does the community want? So for us even being able to issue digital securities and get more voting. So again, power back to the investor, more efficiencies, and you alluded to it a bit too. How can we get to this world where you know, in your green wallet, you're also holding your digital securities, your security tokens. And what can you do with that? It is an asset. Can you loan against it? Can you mortgage against it? Can you borrow it to someone? There's a whole financial infrastructure on top of that. Now we need to be careful because I think the leverage and all these other things and credit now have a bad negative connotation. Again, there's a very positive way to use these in a way that does make sense. But I think generally speaking, um, this security token, digital security paradigm allows for so much more innovation and flexibility with power to the issuer, lower cost, better, cheaper, faster, lower cost of capital, and the investor, uh, easier, simpler, better ways to interact with with an issuer. It's just, it makes sense um, for everyone. It's sort of a win-win-win all around. And, and I think the last one that's important that I think we've talked about before, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's sort of um, under under mentioned is programmatic compliance. So when we talk about regulation in the context of capital markets and securities, I think, you know, and um, I think people hear the word regulation as a bad word. I agree that regulation has gotten a bad word because I, I think that it's typically combined with the idea that there's some group or committee in power with who decides the rules. And I don't think that's what we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about market rules. We need to be thinking about code. We need to be thinking about um, this oracle or idea that the community decides these fair and equitable rules that we need to abide by. You mentioned issuer protections, ongoing obligations, etc. How can we embed that and move that process away from humans making decisions and doing things over to machines and code so that it can be actually applied in a fair and equitable basis. So I think this idea of programmatic compliance is absolutely brilliant. And I think that as regulators get more comfortable with the technology and how people use it, they should be excited about this idea because I think most securities laws are broken and chased after in a, in a, um, uh, a reactive way, right? This SEC comes in and is like, let me see all your documents for the last two years. And you're like, you're years behind where the crime and all the bad things are actually happening. So how can we enforce good habits and good problems into the actual securities. And that's super exciting. And it should be for everyone. Yeah, I, I like your idea about um, more granular voting rights. I mean, that, that's an interesting thing. I've thought a lot about very granular, you know, coupon payments and dividends, where you can instead of paying them quarterly or annually, you can start streaming this like, you know, I talked about this with Matt Haywood on a pad, podcast about streaming them, you know, hourly or by the minute or something like that. I mean, that this just becomes really, really interesting. And the granular voting part really changes. It's a new kind of real shift in terms of how, how much participation investors can have in their investments. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I was just going to say there's, there's, there's two extra things to that. One is um, this idea where you could also facilitate voting by investor versus by share, thereby allowing certain investors to have the same equivalent voice to your largest shareholders for certain things um, in the right context. Um, and, and just – as you chop things up, as you start things, things like fractionalization and smaller things, this idea where just more people can get involved, where maybe a dollar in the United States isn't a lot of money, but a dollar somewhere else on the planet is a lot of money. And so being able to do that um, and making it more equitable to folks. Yeah, like shifting gears slightly towards how the market is developing. I think it's been, you know, maybe I'm kind of in a bubble, but I think it's been kind of a consensus opinion that traditional capital markets will evolve in some way to look more STO like in the future, that they'll leverage some of the technology that we've developed in digital asset markets. You know, maybe that's on a five or 10 year time horizon. Do you, I, that's my view as well, but do you think that's realistic? Because on the other hand, I also feel like the legacy system has 
influence digital asset markets much more than we've influenced them. I think early on, the kind of hope was that we would be able to influence how things are done and regulators' point of view. And over time, I haven't seen that really happen at all. I think very much it's been the opposite. So do you think that view that eventually, you know, traditional legacy markets evolve into like a more digital asset like format is realistic or not? Yeah. And actually, I, I feel like we're a little behind um, and I'll get why we're behind. But I, I'm sure you've seen the quote from the former chairman of NASDAQ and said, uh, you know, all all stocks and bonds on Wall Streets can be tokenized. And within five years, 100 percent of the stocks and bonds on Wall Street will be tokenized. And I think that 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 echoes the idea that the digital infrastructure is better, cheaper, faster, lower cost of capital, lower counterparty risk. It makes sense. But there's so much in the way. And I'd say one of the things in the way is honestly what's going on in crypto. Um, I think that we've um, gotten sort of uh, fat, rich, and lazy a bit, a bit too speculative, a bit too gambling. And I think that there's sort of Bitcoin, crypto, and then digital securities or security tokens. Um, I think the, the crypto middle box has created an entire ecosystem of financial institutions. What's my digital asset strategy? How are we going to custody this stuff? VC firms investing significant capital. I think all the angst on crypto um, has created this sort of like um, side parallel universe, which has taken us away from a lot of the goals of facilitating capital markets, easier, better, cheaper, faster. Um, I think that's one thing. I think the other is just um, a lot of people in the US just say, look, Capital markets seem fine to me. You guys may be trying to solve a problem that I don't. I don't have an issue with. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, the the U.S. capital markets. A lot of people say work sufficiently. I think there's a lot of people that say that not. There's a lot of manipulation. There's a lot of. Um, but the folks that make money today and are in power and have a lot of money are happy the way it works until they can find a way to, it works in the new financial infrastructure. Maybe even in a hedge level, I don't see a lot of them moving as quickly. Now, you and I are both having lots of conversations with a lot of big names looking at the space moving it. So I think it's, I think we're very close to hitting an inflection point. Um, I do honestly probably say this each year, but I would say this next year, 2023, in my view, is the breakout year for uh, digital securities. Because I think as people shift more towards Bitcoin being the truth for both the digital gold, as well as the new money transfer uh, or the payments mechanism, money, and then uh, the digital securities and owning a real assets and stocks and bonds, how we know assets is the thing you should own and not a bunch of speculative pre-mined crypto tokens, um, that that will begin to shift us over to this new age. And, you know, obviously you and I are building um, marketplaces together. You get, like you said, you get a, a few more big name assets you get people to pay a bit more attention and you get people to feel the benefits of this new infrastructure, better, cheaper, faster, more access, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's going to shift. So, you know, we're, I think he, the, the former chairman said that quote, maybe in 2019 or 2018. <laughs> so we're, we're running behind that clock for sure. Um, particularly in the United States, there's more innovation offshore, but I, I think that for sure, five five more years, we're going to be much further along. And I do think that 2023 will be sort of that exponential growth sh uh, curve inflection point. Yeah, no, I, I think we've been talking about STO since like, you know, 2017, since right around ICO started. And, you know, the, the industry still remains kind of small. And I think people often, you know, they wonder why. And, and for me, I think of it as, you know, a, a puzzle with three main pieces, right? You've got technology, you've got investable assets, and then you've got commercially viable regulatory oversight. It's not just regulatory oversight, it's commercially viable. Like we can do this business and we can make money and pay people and survive, right? Like, I think you need those three pieces. That's kind of how I framed it. And we've struggled for a while, probably arguably like even to have the technology, right? So I think transfer restricted assets on liquid is relatively new, right? And the asset management pl platform investable assets is relatively new. I think the Blockstream mining note was one of the first, if not, you know, maybe the first really, you know, investable and modelable asset. And and hopefully there'll be there'll be more behind. And then that third piece has been the big bottleneck, right? Like commercially viable regulatory oversight. Is that kind of how you see it as well? Is that why you think it's taken as long to develop? Are those the three pieces or, or is there something I'm missing? 
No, that's dead on exactly how we think about it. We just, we call them the value layers and sort of the top one is the business where it's the issuer and the investors, right? It's the people looking for capital and it's the people that have capital. Those are one of the most important players, um, different asset classes, et cetera. And then there's the regulatory layer. And I like the way you said it, this commercially viable regulatory layer. And I actually dropped the word regulatory in my value layer framework and now call it market standards because regulation has gotten a, a negative connotation. But this idea that there should be rules, there should be investor protection, there should be uh, global market standards, which we abide by. And then there's the technology piece. Exactly right. I think technology, to be clear, stems beyond liquid network in the blockchain. I think there's much more to be done with uh, automated KYC approval, uh, crypto account funding. Um, just there's increasing ways, you know, like a lot of what we're able to do is allow white labeling and API directly on websites. I think there's just more ways to interact with our phones and the internet. Um, I do see liquid and the blockchain as the core of it, which facilitates all of it and all of the pieces being built on top of it. But I would say... You know, I think there's probably two. I, I would say it's two pieces. I'd say the technology is honestly there. Um, I think it will scale as it needs to. I think as, as more attention and adoption, it'll scale when it needs to, um, just like Lightning is. But on, I would say on the, the business layer, the issuers and the investors, I think there's still an education and adoption standpoint and an awareness. I think um, you know, some of the things we joke about is we have a, a we're, we're trying to problem solve a problem that a lot of people don't know they have. Um, so, you know, getting access, getting access from capital, from people compliantly doing it in a way, allowing, you know, 24 hours a day trading, allowing investors to invest in more than Tesla and Twitter, right? Giving them actual options. And I think that uh, this kind of plays into adoption a bit is, if we can speak to people beyond magic internet money, if the Thanksgiving table orange pill conversation isn't working, guess the best way to talk to people. It's assets. It's saying, hey, by the way, you can own a wallet, you can hold your stuff. And by the way, if you mess up and lose it, we will be able to burn and reissue. So there's a safe way. But you're slowly bringing people into this wallet infrastructure and these other elements that they'll need to gain in order to hold and maintain their wealth and this custody evolution. So there's a whole nother attack vector for people to adopt digital by talking about, um, by talking about assets. Yeah. And I think when you think about the difference in technology and the way markets operate in the legacy system versus, you know, the broader digital asset system, it's amazing that you've got exchanges like, you know, Bitfinex that regularly trades hundreds of millions of dollars a day, 99.999% uptime, right? We don't we don't rest. And all of that is done with like real-time settlement, 24-7 trading, you know, you can self-custody, put, put assets on and off. It's such a massive difference between the legacy system. Like I always highlight that, you know, most of my finance career was, all of my finance career was in Taiwan. And our equity markets here are 9 till 1.30. We don't do weekends, right? You sell your TSMC on Friday. You don't get your cash until next week. Um, don't do Chinese New Year's. So it's almost like you've got these two worlds where you've got a horse and buggy and then you've got a Tesla. And, you know, the, the, the horse and buggy is telling the Tesla how it should be running itself. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like there's a better way to do things. So to me, that's part of the pull factor is eventually people and maybe there's a demographic thing to this as well, where there's, you know, um, there's like 50 percent of the population in the U.S. is, um, you know, uh, I think Gen Z, millennial and post millennial. And so as these people get, maybe it's just millennial and post-millennial, as they get older, they're more familiar with this technology and they take more positions of responsibility and are just naturally more willing to do it. And, and the older guys that have been used to the legacy system kind of, you know, fall by the wayside a little bit. Um, you know, when, when I started in, in sales trading, we used to take orders on the phone and then write down tickets and then walk it over to a dealer who would, <laughs> would pump, put the trade in. That, that's... Uh, <laughs> That's how it was when I started. The good old days. <laughs> the good old days, exactly. Yeah, on the on the generational thing, that's absolutely a problem. You know, we're running a, a global debt IPO right now, and uh, half of the, the 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 investors are, I'd say, probably somewhere you know fifty to, to seventy, and some of them don't want to give social security numbers online. They're like, "Is this secure? How do I sign this? I don't want you to see my signature." And we literally had to have them call the client and do it all in the back end with us never seeing a document 
but us having to be able to put that on the uh, the registry of who owns the shares. And so there is a massive adoption education element to um, the older generation for sure. I can't believe Taiwan nine to one thirty. That's really uh, really short. It's uh, it's pretty good. So um, you're shifting gears again. Over over the course of the last six months, we've seen just like this unprecedented string of blowups. Most most of the blowups, you know, I think interestingly in the previous cycle, it was mostly hacks, right? And the theme of this cycle is really egregious risk management and transparency issues, and then you know some degree of that triggering just outright fraud. So do you think that STOs have a role to play in addressing some of these issues and fixing some of these problems? Yeah, hundred percent. I think you know greed, greed, and ego is driving a lot of this stuff too. I think when people saw the ability to make money, dump on retail, thousand x, two thousand x returns, they'd work backwards and figure out how can I get in early before uh, this thing hits the exchange or get paid. And uh, entire business models were built around this, and then you layer on top of that business models that have leverage and, and loaning against things and re, re- um, and just money moving around so fast, so quick, uh, lack of controls and infrastructure and proper growth and processes. Um, security tokens will be able to help with some of it. I would say not all of it. And then the piece I would say not all of it is I think there's just a human nature element to a lot of the excitement here. I think that being able to guarantee 10,000% returns in a week and yield of uh, 80% tokens, that just – that's not real. It doesn't exist. Like you can't create value out of nothing. And so um, there's this whole notion of getting paid for risk. Um, I think a lot of the transparency um, market standards frameworks um, will help. But we so so one, we won't change human nature of lottery speculation, getting rich overnight. I think as, a, as humanity, we've gotten very short sighted in terms of things that bring us joy. We've gotten away from long-term thinking, and I think is a problem. And the other thing is we're not a panacea for bad humans, like bad actors. I think that there will always be criminals. There will always be crime. There will always be people taking advantage of the system. Um, I think there's just proof, reputation. Uh, I do think that, um, you know, regulated, uh, you know, I, again, I'll say market standards <laughs> will help a lot of this. And, and again, Jesse, I think th- this goes back to why we do stock exchanges. So if you, if you look all the way at the capital markets infrastructure, a stock exchange is the apex of the capital markets, okay? Stock exchanges are SROs. SROs are self-regulated organizations, meaning they are empowered by the regulators to define or to make the rules and be the decision maker in the context of their market rules, Market rules, there are global standards, IOSCO, that's the International Securities Committee, which comes up with global standards that says, here's the information you need in a document to allow someone to have enough information to make a decision, risks, industry overview, financials, etc. There's a diligence element, there's an ongoing obligations element, there are rules around watch trading, insider trading, closed person lists, and all of these things are followed on a pretty frequent basis. And so although manipulation and crime still even happens on NASDAQ today with um, uh, order leading, right, and just ability to manipulate price, it's going to happen. But at some level, um, you know, in the digital security side, and the global structure, there will be ways with market standards and to ways to build in a lot more safety nets. But this is why we went to straight stock exchanges is because there's a bunch of rules and market standards already in place that protect investors, that protect diligence. If a company goes down by law, you have a certain amount of where you come out in the stack of when you're going to get paid out. If you're a creditor versus employee versus an equity owner. And I think there are just tons of rules built around that. Can they be better? Can they be given back to this community-based market approach? A hundred percent. Can they be more code-based versus a group or committee that's making decisions? Yes. But today these global standards already exist. And so if people see that and start to adopt security tokens in the current securities framework we live in, a lot of this harm goes away um, in terms of the things that people are doing. Wash trader and insider trading is everywhere in the crypto, right? Can you tell me that a ten, a 1 million market cap coin trades $2 million a day on one 
the two hundredths exchange? No, like there's so much fake uh, fake volume here, price manipulation, and a lot of these things go away immediately in the context of all of that. Um, the other thing I'll say on on digital securities that I think will will protect a lot is this idea of just multi sig, which is really cool in terms of you could loan against it, you could have someone else hold on to your security. But them not allowing to sell it or do something else, uh, re- hypothecating it without your other key, again, with contracts and laws, allows for you to know exactly where your asset is sitting, depending on your risk tolerance and the type of product you're getting in on. But there's so many other cool ways we can use the technologies that do exist and people are using in the context of securities and loaning and all the cool, flexible stuff we want to provide to investors. And again, the idea of issuer obligations, like, you know, saying what you're going to do with use of funds and reporting standards and reporting obligations. I think all of that adds another layer of transparency to things that would, um, you know, be beneficial. So you just came back from El Salvador recently for the Adopting Bitcoin conference. What, what was that like? What are, do you have any takeaways from that event? Yeah, first of all, I loved it. <laughs> I ate some really good food. Uh, a lot of good, smart people there. I wish I could have gotten around more. It was sort of more work than play, for sure. I didn't allow for much visiting time, although I did make it to uh, Bitcoin Beach, and I, I for sure bought a hat with uh, with my Lightning uh, on the Lightning right. Network. Um, but what, you know, it was generally a lightning network yeah. focused event. I think we probably stood out in terms of the, what we were talking about, but I think one of the, the two things that I heard, um, just one, how exciting lightning is, right? Like this idea of, I can't buy a Starbucks coffee years ago. I'm not going to wait 10 minutes for the next block to roll on the Bitcoin network, expensive, slow, et cetera. And things like what are being done on layer two with lightning, and payments mechanism. There was a lot of just excitement and building and, and development work and people getting excited about the most decentralized secure network on the planet that no one could touch, no pre-mined coins, just how it was born, um, that that there was a lot of excitement there. And then this idea of no more regulation, no more regulation, no more regulation came up quite a bit. Um, and so, which is why I, I talk about regulation all the time. And I think No regulation for your money and your gold, your Bitcoin, but market standards for capital markets. And I think for what us, what we tried to talk about down there is, hey, guys, I know we stand out talking about liquid network, this other building on layer two idea. Remember, and it was something I mentioned earlier, hyper Bitcoinization is people using the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin more. How else can we do that by also tokenizing assets and bringing in more people through the asset angle versus just the Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin is gold angle. So that was one important thing for people to understand that actually the activity on liquid increases the activity on Bitcoin network and lightning and Bitcoin and lightning can be used to fund the assets that you're buying on liquid. And so this whole virtuous circle of increases the activity Um Together And then just, you know, that if, and I mentioned it earlier, if the orange pill at Thanksgiving dinner isn't working where magic internet money is the future, let's get people adopting the digital infrastructure by investing in real assets, real estate, carbon offsets, venture, the block stream mining note. And that should be easier for people to come in versus Dogecoin, MetaMask, you know, payments and, and not your keys, not your crypto. And so I think giving people another way to talk about why this new infrastructure is better and that may be an easier, better way to bring them into Bitcoin, to bring them into a better monetary system is is through digital securities and and security tokens. So is that why you guys have been, you know, you've been pretty big supporters of security tokens on Liquid? Is it because of the security aspect, because you're building off of Bitcoin? Yeah, 100%. I mean, there's not, there's no one else close. So, you know, so if you say on Bitcoin, that's number one. Number two is using Bitcoin as the actual transaction payment mechanism. You don't need another token. That screens out almost everyone. And then if you get down to anyone else in those levels, then you start talking about, okay, how was Liquid born and who backs it? Blockstream, one of the biggest, most important Bitcoin infrastructure companies of the world with the vision and mission aligned with democratization and access and the resources and wherewithal and reputation to create this thing years ago 
and know that it's not Blockstream Liquid. It's a federation that's going to decide the governance and the rules. It's the community. And so I think there's 65 plus federation members, 15 functionaries. Again, as adoption increases, we want more functionaries. We want more decentralization. Everyone incentivized is by decentralizing the network more, but it was purpose built with Blockstream AMP for securities. And so we are just like Bitcoin, we're not, it's not Bitcoin or Liquid Network or DAI. They're just by far the best technologies for what exists and what we need and the problem today in terms of um, what needs to be used. So if there's a better solution that comes along, we'll take a look at it. Absolutely. But Liquid Network is by far uh, the most differentiated and best option from a technology and a compliance and regulatory perspective as well. And we will um, get it approved by a regulator at some point in the near future. Um, and that's just sort of the start. Yeah, I think the regulatory aspect is probably slightly underestimated. Like you look at what happened with Solana recently, and I think there's a lot of concern about assets issued on top of Solana. And then you get, you know, concerns about the regulatory fallout from what happened at FTX. And, you know, is there a possibility that regulators will just take a really hard line on this stuff and say, hey, listen, you know, CFTC has said for a while that they thought Bitcoin and Ethereum were the only assets in the space that were sufficiently decentralized to not be considered unregistered security. So, you know, is, is this the kind of event where they just come out, take a hard line and say, all of this stuff is unregistered securities. Um, what do you think the follow will be from a regulatory perspective on, on this, on the FTX meltdown? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a super hard one. I think there's a lot of people pushing for, um, you know, I, I do think there are, there is value in, in crypto, uh, digital assets outside of Bitcoin. I think it, I do think it's more of an innovation lab or a sandbox. Like, Zero knowledge through fully anonymous transactions. I think there's definitely value add in a lot of these things that are built. And Bitcoin's slow to take these things on, which is why Ethereum came out as sort of the smart contract where you could settle online and it became sort of the uh, place to raise capital in an unregistered securities offering because Bitcoin didn't have these technologies. But I think ultimately everything proper will be built on the most decentralized network using the most sound money on the planet. So they'll all move to Bitcoin and they should get that much attention a sandbox, a lab, but they get way more attention because there's way more incentives and there's way more get rich uh, quick streams. I think regulators, I, I think the U.S. probably has the most to gain and lose in a lot of contexts. I think being the leader of uh, the biggest capital markets in the world is, is hard. I don't think they have to move as fast as other people, which is why you always see innovation happen offshore because they get to be, um, you know, fat and lazy and, and wait. You're the incumbent. You're the you're on top of the hill. Yeah, exactly. They're, exactly. You're on top of the hill. And so I, I think that it's going to be a challenge. I think there's going to be a huge blowback if they just come out and say everything's an unregistered security. I think what would be probably super helpful is how can we – and I think a lot of these will go away, right? 20,000 tokens, 300 exchanges. I think that if they came out and said, look, we understand what you guys wanted. We understand the desires here. you got to admit, guys, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on here. Lottery gambling, lack of investor protections, which our job is to protect against. But we don't want to just blanket throw all of you in jail. We want to give you a solution of how to bridge you from an unregistered securities uh, offering into a, a security if that's what you do. And we want to give you an easy on-ramp to do that. We actually had a name for this at some point calling it the ICO rehab, <laughs> uh, where we were going to help people actually say, look, security is not a bad word. It's okay. And there's people that can help you through this. And we're trying to lower the cost, both in mind share and time to do that. Um, but I think if they come out just fully guns blazing that everything but Ethereum, Bitcoin is an unregistered security, we may have like an actual civil war on our hands. I don't know. But uh, I think they need to come up with a solution because clearly the world is asking for a better way to interact with each other. But I do want to get rid of a lot of the nonsense. You know, I kind of had this view before when crypto regulation first came up, I guess, you know, maybe maybe it was last year, or six months ago or something like that. And, you know, Elizabeth Warren, you know, there's some senior U.S. policymakers that were kind of pushing this forward. And then they found out that there's this constituency within the U.S. that's like kind of independent of race, gender, creed, or party. And they care about this digital asset space a lot. So it kind of became, you know, a bit of a, a, a bit of a third rail. If you touch that, you know, then you have, you could risk offending this really big political cohort. 
But I wonder if that's changed after FTX. So I wonder if that meltdown and so many people getting hurt, it kind of pushes the other way where people are like, hey, listen, help us. You know, we want regulation. So I, I wonder if there's risk there. Yeah, well, I mean, I, your, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, there's a lot of people spending a ton of time trying to unravel the FTX thing. I don't, I, I, I read sort of like what gets put out there, but I don't spend a ton of time. I think it was, you know, it's crazy. Like Sequoia, one of the most well-known venture capital firms in the world, lost whatever, $210 million. I think a lot of people did lack of diligence. I think you start seeing things like Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos, where it was sort of this like, I'll believe you, I trust, FOMO. And I think that there's that that existed everywhere from VC to sort of government to putting our name on an arena. Everyone just sort of, it was trust, but trust. There was no verify ever. And I think that, you know, especially, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, the fallout's really challenging here because I think it, hurt, it did hurt a lot of people. I mean, we, we honestly just frankly had some funds on there as well. We used on and off where we, you know, pay out of our FTX wallet. We were doing some integrations. I think we've been talking to uh, their shop about doing digital securities right. I think, um, you know, w what's interesting is a $32 billion company at the height, we noticed that, you know, how they had the tokenized stocks. If you read the fine print in two different places, one place they said that tokenized share was redeemable. And another place it says it was not redeemable. And they're doing it through a broker dealer, which is not the proper way. It means it's more of a derivative not the actual underlying share. If you don't own the underlying share, you can't actually redeem it. And just so you know, the Tesla shares, the Twitter shares, the MicroStrategy shares that trade on our platform today through Merge, you actually own the share. The corporate actions pass through, done by a broker-dealer that's a member firm on the NASDAQ. You actually own the share today. So, you know, I think so we noticed some you know, kinks in the armor. Now, I won't say I was out there calling shots. I mean, everyone thought that, um, SBF was an absolute genius. They wanted to get involved with him. He was, he's doing a lot of great things. Uh, but the reality of it, it was trust, but trust. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the fallout here. I think it's going to be super, I, I don't know. I think it's going to be super challenging, but hopefully it doesn't, you know, I, I think a lot of crypto people are saying it's going to move the industry back for years and years. I think from a Bitcoin perspective, I hope it gets people to realize that all that stuff is not Bitcoin. You cannot put the two together and that what you guys were doing, investing in stuff you don't understand where there may not be a use case for is also partly on you and your education and getting involved. So, you know, hopefully people are getting more to the truth. And this is where I do think that from a market perspective and timing, Bitcoin and security tokens are at the inflection point because I think this just shines a spotlight on doing it the right way versus doing it the get rich quick way, which I think is, again, like Lunaterra, has continued to cause mass chaos across everyone on the entire spectrum from plebs all the way up to governments and institutions. And so, you know, if people know there's a way that exists that we're building today and it's going to get better, uh, using securities market standards and what Bitcoin's allowed to do, I think it's going to benefit everyone. What about issuers? Like from your conversations with issuers, ha have these blowups of the past couple of months impacted, you know, their their sentiment? No, uh, it goes to the other way. I think what's really interesting is firms that are big names, some that have filed with the SEC, um, large banks in Europe um, have come to us and they've said, we're ready to do this tokenization thing. We still want to learn. And so we've come up with this sort of uh, crawl, walk, run framework in terms of going from something small to maybe one investor and learning about wallets and issuers and KYC whitelist, full on exchange trading, peer to peer self custody, that this is um, sort of the right way to do it. So these banks, these people have come to us, you know why? But because Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the only one that is not considered a security today. Bitcoin is the only thing that's considered to be sort of this thing that someone can't control. And so Bitcoin has actually been the driving reason while people that want to go this new digital infrastructure come to us because they're like, liquid network is my way to Bitcoin. And in fact, that's a big conversation we're having is, hey, guys, using Avalanche or Algorand or Ethereum, how do you know the actual money used in your transactions are not unregistered securities offerings? And if you're actually trying to do this thing compliantly in a securities manner, why would you not use the most risk-averse blockchain protocol and money to facilitate transactions in the world? And so risk-averse 
capital issuers, which are most of them when money and stakes and risk are in the game, are moving to us to have conversations, be, frankly, because of Bitcoin. And so it's, in fact, accelerated beyond other things. And I think, like I said, this idea of people getting access to cool things like the Blockstream Mining Note, that's just the beginning, right? The Volcano Bond, we're creating a product called El Sal is the ticker, which is going to allow us to buy on behalf of retail investors all the different tranches of sovereign debt in El Salvador and make it available to everyone. So let's bring more cool products and then let's get people into Bitcoin together. And But Bitcoin has really been uh, a big driving gravitational force to people accelerating their ideas in and around moving into the digital infrastructure. So I'm seeing a massive uptake, in, in fact, in, in activity and conversations. That's great. Final, final question. What do you think the STO industry looks like in, in 10 years? I think that's where everyone's comfortable on their phone, holding their own assets in a wallet like green assets they're loaning against. Um, hopefully, I, I'm thinking by then that uh, regulatory and security standards in terms of the friction, how they're allowed to move, gets lowered. It's sort of like once you get KYC AML whitelisted into a, a huge global framework, then you should be able to honestly send things peer to peer. Like, why wouldn't I be able to send you uh, without showing accreditation status or anything, a blockstream mining note or some sort of security. It's just another asset. I think, you know, things like crowdfunding rules um, and the, the massive secular trends and around people investing on their own um, is just going to proliferate. Like, so what we've built on the other side of the marketplace, besides this democratization or access to global capital, is we want hundreds, if not thousands, if not eventually millions of mini IPOs, because ultimately these people are raising capital from global communities and global communities coming in, but we have to completely destroy the cost and the friction for that to get in. But we just see a substantially more frictionless society around how securities move with proper market standards. But I think a lot of this sort of like esoteric 34 Act, 33 Act, 40 Act stuff that creates so much cost and bloatedness is going to eventually move. And we are seeing uh, the kinks in the armor sort of move away from that as, you know, the accredited investor rules in the United States change. And, and sorry, talking so U.S. centric, I think everyone uses that as the framework at which regulation moves. But generally speaking, crowdfunding rules, accreditation rules are moving in the right direction. They're just really, really slow. So, you know, the Bill Gates quote, right? We, we, um, we, we underestimate um, what can happen in or overestimate what can happen in two years and underestimate what can happen in 10. And so I think in 10 years, it's going to look much, much different. I think capital markets will be denominated in Bitcoin. It'll be no more USD denominated in Bitcoin. Um, and it'll, you know, people will swap in and out, but Bitcoin will be the global reserve currency of, of monetary assets as well. That's great. I think we could probably go for another two hours. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Should, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pause it here and then we'll have to have you back on and we'll, uh, you know, update in a couple of months and revisit and, um, yeah, keep, 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 the, keep the conversation going, I think. Yeah, appreciate it, Jesse, and uh, look forward to picking up those uh, Bitfinex securities and, and digital conversations again. Sounds good. <laughs>